So um, <clears throat> once again, thank you all for joining us this afternoon because it's now afternoon and I can say that. Um, just a little bit of a background on this. We've been doing the Derby program for over 30 years and we've had great success. This year we have, and I'm probably wrong, but Tara can correct me. She's here to, to run a little IT support for me. Um, but we have over 290 derbies that are going on around the state this year. So this is a very popular program and we thought it'd be a good idea just to reach out to all the Derby sponsors, do a Zoom call like this and go over a few of the, you know, policy procedures, things mm -hmm. like that, but, but really just help provide y'all with more of what you need. Um, you know, we obviously have limitations with what we can provide, but um, just have a little bit of a dialogue about what you can do to, to have the best event possible, other resources available, things like that. So once again, thank you. We've got a few more uh, that are coming in. So I won't get into too much of this until we got everybody out of the waiting room. Why is it not getting the end? So bear with me just a few and a um, little bit of what we're going to do. Uh, we will do question and answer, but we will do that through the chat feature uh, yeah. on the um, on here. Um, thought I heard somebody's voice. Uh, I'm going to ask that everybody stays on mute. We've got 40 on the call and climbing. So if everybody starts trying to talk at the same time, I guess you don't have to have those uh, reminders as much as we did back in the first days of COVID when we all started trying to figure this out. So um, <clears throat> my name is JJ Gladden. I work for Arkansas Game and Fish Commission and I am an assistant uh, chief in the education division. So some of the things that are in the umbrella that we have is uh, obviously fishing derbies. That's why I'm here. We also have the family and community fishing program, which is uh, 49 ponds and growing across the state. They're focused in population centers. Um, and we do different events through those throughout the year. Uh, some of you are quite possibly having your derby at one of those locations. Um, on here running some support is Tara Bennett. She is the admin for um, fishing education, BOW, so many different programs that we have within Game and Fish. And we have Bo Davidson on here as well. And he is the Fishing in the Natural State uh, program coordinator. Uh, and we would likely have a few people from those uh, Fishing in the Natural State schools on here or 4-H or different organizations like that. But to give a, a brief rundown, it's basically a curriculum designed 4 through 12 that helps us uh, give educators, whether they're traditional or non-traditional educators, uh, additional tools to be able to help teach fishing and conservation uh, education, especially when it applies to the aquatic environment. So it looks like we've got most people out of the waiting room. Um, once again, I do appreciate, looks like I've got an email about somebody can't get in. Stand by just a second. I'm just going to forward this to Tara and see if she can get her an email or a uh, link into here. Okay, sorry about that. So um, the first thing that we're going to talk about is the paperwork for applying for a derby. Obviously, you've gotten through at least half of that because you're here, right? You're all derby sponsors. You're all putting on events in your area. And we have, you know, uh, scheduled fish. We've done that request through our culture system. So fish are coming. So one of the main things that we talk about um, that can be a sticking point for people is reporting about your event within 
30 days of your event. So we ask that those reports come in 30 days after your event. Um, there is a link right next to the sponsor a derby tab that you clicked when you applied for a derby. There is a link for reporting right there. We're doing reporting online. It saves us uh, lost paperwork because if you put in your information into that form, it automatically goes into a spreadsheet unless the uh, unless Google crashes, that information is always going to be there. So it's not something that's going to get lost in the mail. It's not something that um, gets sent to the wrong email address or something like that. Um, and Tara or Bo looks like Bo is putting uh, the links of those reports into the chat. We're going to utilize the chat to give you those links that you need. Um, throughout this call, as well as use the chat for uh, asking any questions. So uh, another major thing on the paperwork that I would get in trouble if I did not remind you is if you are a repeat derby, which all of you would be at this point, we need those derby applications for the following year by December 15th each year. That is, um, there's a lot of paperwork and things like that that probably uh, y'all aren't that concerned with that has to be done on our side so that we can get all of this information and make sure that we have enough fish to grant all of the requests for the Derby program to our uh, hatchery system and our culture system. So uh, some of you may or may not know, we have four warm water hatcheries around the state which supply us with channel catfish. They supply a lot of different fish for the agency, um, bass, shad, brim, all kinds of fish uh, that go into public waters. But um, where we utilize them the most is they produce close to 200,000 catchable catfish for the derby program and for the family and community fishing program annually. So that's, that's quite a bit of coordination of getting those trucks loaded up and to those locations, especially when it comes to derbies, because y'all have one day that y'all are gonna go fishing, right? And we wanna make sure that we've got fish on a truck and headed your way in a timely fashion, and that takes a little bit of coordination. So that's why we ask that we get all those derby applications on the 15th so that we are far in advance and we can get everything scheduled and not have any, um, mess ups on our part. So um, Tara, did I miss anything on paperwork and reporting? Well, I'm not sure what you told them since I <laughs> had about six phone calls there. Uh, just make sure that your derby report is in uh, within 30 days after your derby. You do not need to send in registration forms. Uh, there's nothing that you have to mail in. Just uh, do that online report. Yep. Um, and that's, you know, we try to keep it as simple as possible. Those of you that have been with us for a long time in the Derby system, there you a lot of paper reporting. There were volunteer sheets. There were, I mean, we basically killed a forest every year with all the paperwork that we we're sending back and forth. So we're trying to streamline it and um, reduce postage costs and loss uh paperwork by doing as much online reporting and requests as we can so um do we have any questions from this group about uh the paperwork or the reporting part of all this i figured we get the most boring part out of the way to start with and then we'd really jazz it up a little bit as we went Okay, doesn't look like we have anything in the chat. Um, I do have a, a question for the group. How many of you, this is your first derby that you've done? You can just uh, type first one in the chat or raise your hand, whatever, whatever y'all want to do. But just kind of curious of what kind of a mix, if this is uh, a brand new Derby for y'all, or if y'all been doing this, you know, you're one of our originals that have been doing this for 20 plus years. 
Okay, I'm seeing several first ones in here. Um, okay. I do have one question. I don't want to be that person that asks all the questions, but this is my first one. And I know I was supposed to send something to the city and then they send something back and then I send it to you all. Is that correct? You're probably talking about form 1A. Yes, sir. Well, I didn't yeah. realize she emailed me and I needed to pay for it. So I just did that today and she's supposed to send me form A back today. And then I send that to you all. Is that correct? Okay. What are you having to pay for? Something with the, this the pavilion. Oh, okay. 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 I was like, no, we shouldn't be charging you anything there. No, so. just for the pavilion. And she was waiting on that payment before she sent me the paperwork I needed. Okay. I got you. You know, that's just one of those. Uh, yeah. So to answer your question, once you have a signed form 1A, uh, you can scan and send that to us, uh, whatever. I mean, that's probably the best. I've been preaching about the the online side of things so that we don't lose anything in the mail. So if you can send that to Tara, um, okay. scan and send or something like that, that's probably best. And we started doing that several years ago because, you know, when you're talking about these city park ponds, we were running into, you know, somebody might have a... Uh, want to have a derby at Lake Valencia there in Maumelle, but there was a group that had the pavilion or the pier or something like that booked, and mm -hmm. those two groups didn't talk. So uh, in those high traffic areas, we definitely wanted to make sure that everything was cleared with the with the city to make sure there wasn't any double booking, and then uh, everybody looks bad on all directions. So did that, did that help answer it? That cleared it up. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Any other, let me make sure. Um, I, I have a question. Okay, go ahead. Up here at BHDC, they've been putting these fishing derbies on for many years. And uh, the guy that used to be in charge of all this, he'd uh, left. So this is mine and Tyler's first time doing this. So we're not quite sure on paperwork or any of that stuff. So this is all kind of new when you talk about reporting after 30 days. So we're gonna need help trying to get to the links and everything. Okay. Um, if you'll put your email in the chat, I'll make sure that Tara sends you an email with all the uh, links. You can send it direct to Tara or me, either one, and we will make sure that we send you an email that's got all that reporting stuff in it. It's also in the chat, but we'll make sure that we've got some back and, back and forth correspondence going on. Sure, yeah, because all the fish and everything's already ordered. Ours is coming up in May, but we're just not quite sure on the reporting afterwards and everything else. So. Now, Mr. Schaefer, I just tried to email you the link to the Zoom, right? You called me. Yes. And um, it kept being returned telling me that my email to you had been blocked. So I sent it through um, our registration system, and I guess you got that one. Yes. I'll, uh, okay. I think I've got your email, so I'll send you an email. That way you have it. Okay. How's that? And then that way, and I'll request that we need some help with the forms and links. Okay. Perfect. Thank you, ma'am. Okay, so Jamie asked about getting permission from the school. Um, I mean, if you are an educator at school, as long as your administration knows what's going on, you don't have to send us anything. We do have um, we do have locations. Uh, Spirit Lake and Conway comes to mind, where there are a few outside organizations that have been over the years allowed to do a derby on school property. Um, they have to do those on the weekend, of course, as you would suspect, or during the summer break. But uh, with those groups, we do ask that they, you know, confirm with the school that they have permission because we, that's the last thing we want to do is get into the middle of somebody's argument of whether they're allowed to have an event there, not, you know, and, and date arguments. That's why we did that form 1A. But when it comes to a school, you should be good to go um, as long as you clear, cleared it with the administration. Mr. Cantrell, you're breaking up a little bit. Um, if you put your question in the chat, we'll we'll cover that. Um, I, I couldn't make out any of the words. It just sounded like a uh, you were driving through a tunnel. Yes, it's been breaking up the whole time. 
Hey, JJ, I just wanted to brag on Bo for just a minute. He brought us a new kit this year. My teacher was so excited for the green towels and all the new poles. I, I was just really happy to get it. Thanks, Bo. Perfect. I'm glad that, I'm glad to hear as Bo's supervisor that he is making people happy because that's that's kind of what we're going for. We've, we've kind of got some of the uh, best jobs that you can because until we say no, and that's pretty rare that we do say no, um, we generally are in the business of making people happy. So fishing is a, an exciting thing. We want as many people to, to share that excitement as possible. Um, Petty Jean, as long as you cleared it with the state superintendent, you should be good to go on a, a derby at Petty Jean. So uh, we're not going to require a Form 1A on that. Um, and it looks like Harley Spears wants to know about getting a kit. Uh, are you talking about a derby kit or are you talking about a fence kit? Okay, so those are the fence kits. And Bo, I'm going to ask you to just put a link to fins in the chat. So that's the program that is designed four through 12. And you would go to a professional development that's six hours and um, fill out the application to be a part of the program. And then, uh, but Bo can send you that, he put the link in there and he can also reach out and get with you about his upcoming professional developments. Um, so if, you want to change the Derby location. Um, we ask for that 30 days in advance. And Tara replied that she's working with somebody on a date change. So, okay, yeah, that's, that, we'll say that's in paperwork and reporting. Um, so if you're a new Derby, which um, you've already went through this, it's 60 days prior. If you're a repeat derby, it's December 15th, the, the previous year. Um, if you're going to do a location or date change, we need that 30 days in advance. And that's not 30 days in advance and you're moving it to the next week. That's 30 days in advance for both the uh, expected date and the move date. And I'm not I'm trying to interrupt you, JJ, but any FINS sponsor, sponsor needs to have their derby request in by December 15th as well so that we can make sure you're on the books when we approach fisheries management during that meeting. Right. That is exactly true. Um, okay, derby kits is next on my list, but I want to make sure I've got all these uh, – uh, changes and and all that paperwork reporting, all that part nailed down before we move on to it. But I did see it. It's just uh, I will come to it next as soon as. How was that? About uh, that one one eight. Sir. Oh, I see your question here in the, no, that's. Yes. So is your question in the chat? Yes. Um, I'm saying a Jody Atkins. I'm not saying a Jody. Jody, Jody Atkins. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Oh, so we got another Jody in the house, too. Hey, okay, yes. I like that name. Yeah. Uh, my question is, is pretty simple. Uh, first year here, teacher, school resource officer. Been to two fish and derbies here at the school. We go to a stock pond. Uh, I think Game and Fish come stock that pond right before the derby. Uh, my question was, as far as broken rod and reels, the towels, and all that other stuff, is that replaced, or how do we go about fixing that um if you are with a school um you will work with and you're in the fishing in the natural state program you will work with Bo on broken rods reels uh and equipment 
I know that when he does his professional development and he probably provides a link to a video that we shot back during COVID on simple real repair, things like that. But if you've got something that's uh, beyond your scope of fixing, just get with Bo and he will work with uh, getting any broken equipment replaced or fixed. Okay, is that Mr. James Davison? Yes. Okay, I have a contact so, number for him. Yeah, Some sorry. of them ended up with that number. Yeah, that I'm surprised that there's not something going around here that calls me Joseph. That uh, that back and forth uh, legal names and what we go by, it's uh, it confuses some people, and I understand that it confuses me half the time. And uh, Mr. Uh, Williams had a good question. What is a derby kit? Oh, okay. Well. Stand by and I will get to it. Let me make sure that I've got all these questions already. There is not paperwork to fill out on a derby date change. You just contact Tara and she will walk you through it. Yeah. Um, and does AGSC stock the water source number of fish based on the volume? So uh, there are a few factors that go into the number of fish stocked for a derby. Um, and that is uh, the, the pressure that that location has, the water body size, the number of people that are coming to the Derby, and if it is going to be a catch and release Derby. So there are multiple factors that we use in determining how many, um, how many fish go into a water body for a Derby. Okay, um, I'm gonna move on to derby kits at this time, if everybody feels good about it. Tara, can you drop a form 1A yeah. link? Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I think or, so. Or just email it to them. I'll just email it. I'll okay. email it to you. Okay. Um, Okay, so a derby kit. So we had several first time people. A derby kit is short for a education kit that we provide to derby sponsors that are not in the fishing in the natural state program. So the derby kit is meant to be an educational tool for our derby sponsors to use when they're teaching people that may or may not know the ins and outs of fishing. Okay, um, Mr. Cantrell, can you put yourself on mute? Okay, so. Um, a lot of people refer to these as a prize kit. Game and Fish cannot provide prizes for your derby. That is not something that we are allowed to do. And with approaching 300 derbies throughout the year, that's not something that we can afford to do even if we were allowed. So um, we encourage you to reach out in your local community to find derby sponsors, uh, people that may give you a discount on items, things like that. Uh, most of the time we find that it's pretty easy to get a group uh, or a few different organizations, businesses, things like that to, to kick in a few items for prizes for your derby. But as far as the derby kit, that is a educational, as a box of educational items that is to be used to teach people at your derby different parts of a rod and reel, how to cast, um, how to tie on a hook. I'm probably leaving things out, but basically it's to give them a little bit of a, a head start on learning how to fish if this is something new to them. I think it'd be fantastic if, it, if at each event derby sponsors would you know, do a little 15 minutes. If you had a, a uh, oh, I'm losing my words here now. Um, but if you had an opportunity where everybody is gathered up at once, kind of go through these, you know, this is how you tie on a hook. 
or how to cast things like that kind of go through a little miniature fishing uh basics spiel and that's why we put the beginning fishing guide in there so that you have a reference to a few of those different skills and you can point to things where they can uh, see those different uh you know techniques and methods we also have a few fish identification books in there talking about um, when you're talking about rules and regulations on fishing, especially outside of the derby, because that's that's the goal is, uh, you know, you have this fun fishing experience at a pond or wherever you're um, fishing at, you want people to do that. You want them to have the skills that they need to go and, and do it on their own. So you want people to be able to identify those fish and to um, know the rules and regulations for where they're going. So talking about those things is, is really important to making sure that we don't set somebody up to, to get their hand slapped down the road. So I'm gonna run through the list of what is in a kit. You're gonna have one fishing pole. You're gonna have some bait. It's gonna be pr uh, prepared bait. People call it stink bait. We actually have magic bait in there. We actually have uh, Catfish Pro, which is an Arkansas product. There will be a small tackle bag. We've got uh, five starter kits, which consist of a bobber, a sinker, and a couple of hooks. Some stickers that are different fish, the common fish that are found in Arkansas, uh, especially in a pond setting. The fish ID books and the beginning fishing guide. There will also be an envelope that has uh, rules, tips for your event, and it will have promotional items for the Fishing in the Natural State program, the Family and Community Fishing program, um, our patch program, and something new for this year is what we're calling the Arkansas Grand Slam, which is if a individual, young or old, it does not matter, we're not going to uh, uh, exclude anyone, but if you catch a catfish, brim, bass, crappie, and trout in one calendar year, we're going to provide you a sticker that is actually pretty sweet. If I do say so myself, I spent a lot of time on the design on that. So that items that will be in uh, the derby kit. Let's see. Um, I know people have been putting questions in here, so. There is the sticker. Oh, there it is. There it is. See, look how great that looks. I mean, who doesn't want one of those, right? Um, thank you, Tara. You're welcome. Um, in the past, we've received a couple of rods and reels, tackle bags. Will that no longer happen? Um, Daryl, if you are in the Fishing in the Natural State program, then you will no longer receive uh, a derby kit because when you join the program, um, when you join the Fishing in the National State program, you actually get 24 rods and reels with that. So us providing a additional fishing pole for educational purposes uh, would just be redundant at that point. Okay. <clears throat> um, Mr. Jody, did you get to a place with a little bit better signal? Did did we answer your questions yet? Yes. Okay. Okay. I just well, I'm trying to, to find that, that. that form one. Where is your derby? It's in uh, McCabe. Yeah, you don't need form one A. You don't need it. No, there's only a few ponds that require it. Uh, Hot Springs is a place that oh. requires it. Little Rock requires it, but McCabe is not one. Okay. Um, so if you, okay, so Harley, if you are doing an event where the community fishing guys are going to be there, they are going to have that stuff with them. Um, so if you've got Clint and or Maurice coming to your derby, then they were, they're going to bring more bait more poles than 
then we would be able to provide. So that's something that will be covered through them. Okay. Um, so one other thing when it comes to the, uh, the derby kits, I've got it nested in there, is we actually, uh, during COVID, spent a lot of time making videos um, that are fishing related. I think Bo is gonna drop that link into the chat. So especially for those, uh, out there, you know, if you've got your group in a classroom setting, you could play a few of those videos, you know, maybe one a day, something like that, where they're seeing the, the uh, videos that we made about casting, rigging a, a fishing pole, tying a knot, things like that. So if you do have that uh, environment where you can share a video, you know, there, that's a really good resource. But if not, that beginning fishing guide that it will be in that derby kit which is also in the uh, fishing in the natural state kits, you know, does a really good job of walking people through that as well. Cause I know, uh, you know, just like all the, uh, just like all your students, participants, things like that are not gonna be at the same skill level when it comes to fishing. That's also true for derby sponsors. You know, there's people that have been fishing their whole lives and are considered, uh, you know, an avid angler but there's also people that are just trying to do something really good for their community and have a community event and fishing seems like a great idea. And we want to provide y'all with as many tools as possible to make your event a success because your success is ultimately our success. I, I talk to different groups all the time about, you know, Game and Fish has, or uh, sorry, Arkansas has 3.3 million people. We have, nearly 100,000 miles of streams, uh, over 60,000 acres of lakes, and Game and Fish has less than 600 people. If, if the future of our waters is reliant on Game and Fish employees, we're struggling, we're in big trouble. So it takes groups just like this coming together and, and sharing that passion for the outdoors, for fishing, for healthy waters to, to help us um, have success when it comes to uh, conservation efforts. Um, Tia, Bo, drop that link in there. It's right above your comment. Hopefully you've got that. Um, you do not have to give the derby kit back after your derby. Um, so I should really stop the recording on this, but we are, after your derby kit has been used for education, um, you can use it for events down the road, but at that point it served its purpose and its uh, life expectancy because it would be pointless for y'all to try to get that back to us. At that point, whatever is done with that equipment, um, we hope and ask that it is used for for good. I, I don't want to see it in a trash can is I guess what I'm saying. So whatever that derby sponsor deems necessary with that educational equipment that we provide after the event is up to the derby sponsor. Um, Daryl, we are not, uh, one, we do not have catchable bass in our hatchery system. Uh, as far as the hatchery system, we have for the most part, around two inch fish is what goes out. When it comes to catfish, they try to get them to six to eight inches um, before they stock them. But the catchable size fish that are produced through the hatchery system is what we have um, available for the derby program. Okay. So it's those, it's those 14, 13 to 14 inch fish is what we try to go for because it's the the only one that's truly cost effective to get them to that level. And um, I'm going to say give them away, but obviously they're going to a greater good, but trying to, trying to get a pass to, to a size that is quote unquote catchable is a far more monumental task. Okay. I understand. Yeah. That's a good question though. Um, you know, a lot of people ask about that and people ask about brim stockings as well. And um we do not specifically raise 
uh, brim species, especially bluegill, for our catchable um, stocking. But we do sometimes have those fish mixed in with the catfish, and you may get a bonus, you know, ten or so bigger bluegill. So, okay. but as far as bass goes, uh, yeah, we we use those for brood stock and taking care of the rivers and lakes. Gotcha. Thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, I think uh, Susie's question is probably fin related, Bo, if you want to tackle that. Um, I don't know what you consider a conservation activity, but uh, you get after that one uh, in the chat. Um, I have fishing poles at Before H Kids uh, uh, check out along with tackle boxes. Um, okay, yeah, I mean, I think that works really well. Um, you know, and we ha do have, you know, you said the checkout system, that's something that we is another one of our programs. So I'm going to use that to, uh, spring into the other programs and the support that Game of Fish has to offer. I think we've covered fins. Uh, we call it fins on the inside. It's fishing in the natural state. Um, we have family and community fishing program, which has 40 nine locations around the state, great spots to, to go and have your event if you don't have a pond that's, you know, on school property or park property or, or wherever you're looking at. And it actually um, is something that would get trout during part of the year, um, but they do occasionally get retired brood bass if that location is suitable for that. I know that there was a 10 pound uh, largemouth caught in Sunset Lake that came from our Andrew Holsey hot, uh, Hatchery and Hot Springs. So those family and community fishing locations are, are really good to go after the derby or even to host your derby at if you're looking for a good spot. I talked about the Grand Slam. We also had the patch program and participation in a fishing derby is something that qualifies you for that patch. There will be a brochure in your derby kit talking more about that, or you can go online and check it out. It's really neat. It's it's across eight different activities, uh, hiking, shooting, paddling, uh, so many different things, just trying to, to help people in their walk course. Um, there's, there's also, uh, you know, a lot of people know us for shooting sports, archery in the schools. Uh, so there's there's so many outdoor uh, programs that that we do through Game and Fish. I just encourage you to go to our web page. Uh, maybe Bo or Terry will drop a link just to the education page on our website, which will show you all the different programs that we have. But I, you, I ran through all those others to talk about the Tackle Loaner program, which actually has rod and reels across the state um, that people can just check out. So if you've got a group that, that may or may not have a fishing pole, you can go on the webpage, find Tackle Loaner, and you can check out a couple of rods and reels from them. So that's another resource to help um, alleviate some of that pressure. I mean, yeah, rod and reels aren't as expensive as a gun, but, you know, money is a, uh, a barrier to some people, uh, you know, so that is a resource that we make available. You know, we probably got a thousand rod and reels in circulation around the state. So let's see, let's catch back up with our questions. Um, okay, Tara answered the question about a fishing license. Yes, you are required by state law. And when I say state law, like our legislature has definitely commented on this and weighed in. Uh, if you are 16 or over, you are required to have a valid fishing license to fish in Arkansas. Uh, there's probably rumors circulating around about waivers. We've tried to squash those over the years. We are not by law allowed to provide a fishing waiver for someone who is of the age to be a license holder. Um, so while that 
likely is not the answer that many people want. That is the one that we are required to give. Um, if you are only helping, you are not actively fishing, especially by yourself, you can help a child fish without the holding your license. Well, the period um, will leave at 3.30 today for the game. The Pee Wee players will leave um, at 3.30 today for the game. And, yeah. and thank you. Somebody came off mute there. Um, I think we're getting a school announcement. Um, let's see. Now, I do encourage anybody that's taking someone out fishing to go ahead and buy a license. It is 50, great investment, and it uh, actually doubles the amount of money that we get for conservation here in the state. So 1050 is a small price to pay for pristine and beautiful Arkansas streams and, and waters and the fish that go into them. Um, yes, there will be a recording of this. Um, free fishing weekend, June 20, uh, June 9th through 11th, which will also have the hatchery derbies. There'll be four hatchery derbies on free fishing weekend, which will be on June 10th from eight to 12. Those locations are Hot Springs, Centerton, Corning, and Lone Oak. Um, I, I would assume that uh, we'll send out an email about that to our Derby sponsors. It'll be all over Facebook, radio, billboards, all the, the things like that. Um, Okay, uh, Amy, did that answer your question about your volunteers? Um, if they're fishing by themselves, um, they would have to have a license. But if they are genuinely just assisting with casting, and if somebody gets one on the end of the line, they're they're helping make sure that they get them in and don't lose them or lose their pole to the water, mm -hmm. then uh, then they're going to be in the clear. Okay. Uh, and I did encourage them last year. There just were some, you know, that were holding out and I didn't want us to get in trouble. Yeah. Yeah. Once again, I, I mean, I think it is a great investment. I think it's really good for conservation in our state. Um, but our enforcement officers are really good. And that's who would be writing a ticket if there was an issue that they, they are trying to evaluate the situations and they're not going to, they don't want to give us a black eye by walking into a, a derby and, and just, handing out tickets like it, you know, like they're trying to meet a quota, which we don't have quotas. Um, but, you know, we're, we're going to do our best to work with everybody. That's, that's what we want to do. We, we want as many partners in conservation as we can get. And fishing is that avenue for so many people. Um, you do not have to check for licenses. Um, if you want to make mention of that as the sponsor, but you, I mean, I would make the comment if you're the Derby sponsor that you are required to have a license if you're 16 or over, making that announcement to, to your participants um, removes a little bit of your liability. Now, you're not going to get some aiding and abetting ticket from Game and Fish. I don't even know that that exists, but uh, just, just a little CYA situation of, you know, making sure that everybody knows this is the expectation to fish. Uh, if you are 16 or older, you are required by law to have a fishing license. And then it becomes their choice if they want to be a violator at that point. Hey, Gary, uh, there, there's a prime example of somebody that's worked with, um, with Clint Maurice and, and built, obviously from the chat, a, a very large derby with with a great example of bringing in partner organizations and, and really making this a true community event. Um, Gary Casey is the, the gentleman that was part of the brainchild. It may have been the entire brainchild of the big catch that's hosted here in Little Rock, which actually has two different events, one in the spring and one in the fall, uh, utilizing different partners. So, um, Gary, um, for your derby, um, especially at Valencia, we're, we're putting uh, a significant amount of fish in there because we definitely do not want, um, when you got 1,500 people that want to go out and go fish and you don't want them to, to leave with a sour taste in their mouth. Um, 
not sure the question on intellectual disabilities. Um, oh, sorry. I say it above now. Sorry, I skipped over that. Um, so are you talking about a derby specifically for that? Oh, okay, for a license. Um, I do not. There, There is a disabled license on our website that you have to go through an application process for, and I am not uh, completely versed and all the ins and outs of that, it actually is done through our license system. So you fill out an application and they're able to make that determination. That's not something that I do at my level. Um, additional print materials um, would be, you can send that request to Tara who would then send it to the right direction. I think we're in the midst of a new system on how to request those materials. Um, but we do provide a ton of our literature online as well. So uh, it's a back and forth at that, po at that point. But uh, if you have any requests like that, we'll at least take them and see what we can do with it. Okay. Um, Lifetime, there we go. Okay, so um, as far as the stocking of fish, we typically stock our fish the day before the event, whether that's first thing in the morning or in the evening, just kind of depends on how far you are away from the hatchery. So um, in that amount of time, they should be acclimated to the, to the water body. That's the thing about fishing. Um, you know, it kind of makes me think about some of the, uh, like at the big catch this year, we had a, a pool in the middle of one of the halls that was brought in by an outside group where they were fishing for trout. I mean, you can literally see all the trout there, but you know, your, your catch rate was like 10 fish an hour. And I know that there's 500 trout in there. So there's there's a lot of factors that go into um, whether you're going to have a lot of stress on fishing or not, the weather, uh, which includes atmospheric pressure as much as it does temperature. So if you're having um, repetitive issues with catch rates, um, you know, you might want to look at different baits and things like that and just and kind of work through it that way. It's just like the same reason that professional bass anglers, I mean, these are professionals, right? But they've got 10 different rods and reels on the deck of their boat because you just don't know what that fish wants that day. So uh, they can be, they can be kind of fickle, but, um, you know, trying as much, uh, worms and liver as you are hot dogs as you are prepared bait you know kind of having that variety available to figure out what those fish are wanting to go after um are are the uh license for fishing same price for so yeah our license for fishing is 1050 and it's for anybody 16 or over after you hit 65 you're then qualified for a lifetime license uh for a 65 plus lifetime license and you're after you buy it once you're you're done after that um a citizen who owns a fish transport business asking about stocking additional fish for our event uh Okay, Harley, uh, you're at BB, correct? Yes. Yes. Okay, um, that, that pond in BB is city property. And if you want to stock fish on in the city of BB's property, that's y'all's prerogative. Um, I, I, as long as they come from a certified location where this is, um, which a certified fish dealer is a whole different can of worms, but as long as it's a, a licensed and inspected 
an approved location by Arkansas Game and Fish? Yes. Okay. Um, um, Charity, uh, the disability independent living in Harrison, um, as far as if they have to have a license, if they're over 16, they are required by law to have a license. And that's, once again, the thing that I am required to tell you, because um, that is the law. Now, whether a ticket is written or not, that's not my choice. But by law, that's, that's where we're at on that. Okay. Um, I think with some of the questions that we're getting, I think it's the appropriate time to go into my next section, which is the rules and regulations. Um, I told you I was going to get all that boring stuff out of the way, but this is uh, not intended to be a buzzkill for this conversation. It's meant for um, everything going as smoothly as possible because we want everybody to, to have a good time we want all the expectations to be met and for it to be something that's successful and that we keep having year after year. But I want to remind everybody it's in the paperwork. Um, when you're filling out your application, you're supposed to read through the rules and regulations that are provided. It's probably got a fancier name, but that's what I'm calling it right now. Um, but you cannot charge people to come to your event. There are no fees for fishing. This is a free service. This is a uh, free fish and all that. We cannot allow this to become a fundraiser. If you want to have a snack stand set up on the side, if you have vendors that come in, they can charge for their products. But as far as to fish at the Derby, we cannot allow anybody to charge a fee or use that as the fundraiser. Like I said, things on the uh, the outside of that can be a fundraiser. You know, if a civic organization wants to sell snow cones, get after it, but cannot charge for the fishing. Um, we do require, um, there are probably examples on this call because I saw a few that uh, said they've been doing this for 20 years plus. Um, as of, I'm going to say it was probably about 2010. Uh, don't don't quote me on that, but that's that's a good estimate. But for over 10 years, we have not allowed um, private water bodies to be stocked for a derby. If a private water body is stocked with game and fishes fish, so state fish, which are free, they are then required to make that public fishing for 60 days. So we are not um, we are not doing any new private waters. Uh, so <laughs> it must be a public water body for you to be approved for a fishing derby. I'm sorry, can you guys hear me? I've not done Zoom before. <laughs> uh, yes, apologize for that. So uh, if if you have a minute, I'd like to jump in and just uh, I wanted to touch bases real quick. I'm sorry, I'm at work, so I want to get that out of the way. Um, so our catch rate, you were talking about that earlier. I hate to back you back up on that, but mm -hmm. our catch rate was absolutely zero this past derby that we've had. We um, can y'all hear me okay? Yes. Okay. Uh, we we purchased and got a block off net we are fishing a 30 acre body of water where we're getting our fish stock i've talked to bo at agfc and they they recommended that we get that do y'all do y'all would y'all help with us making that a better net or is there a program that we can get a loaner net the one that we have actually we spent a lot of money on and it's a little bit short and I think most of our catfish got out of it. The whole sizes are about three quarters. So um, uh, we we did the floats on the top and cut off one into the lake. And we just, I think most of our fish got out. I don't know if they jumped over or went yeah. under. 
<clears throat> yeah. Um, Sarah, so, game let of me fish. Cut in there, JJ. Okay. Sarah, I understand you're there in Valonia in that area there. Uh, next yes. year, the Valonia Pond, the Valonia, city of Valonia has a pond that's going to be opened up for dirt. Yes, and, yeah. we, and we were, I talked to Tony about that, and I think we're going to move to to that next year. I feel like we're a little bit late uh, jumping to the Is this Bo? Yes, it is. <laughs> well, how are you, sir? You're doing good. Good to see you. Uh, but yes, uh, so um, we're 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 thinking about moving to that next year, and and that's our plan. But I think we're a little little late on, you know, getting that changed over this year. Right. If you would, Sterling, go ahead and give me a call a little bit later today, and we'll talk about the plans on that. Okay, I'll do that. Thank right. you, folks. To uh, to kind of wrap that up into a nice, uh, neat little package. When it comes to block off nets, game of fish um, does not help with block off nets. And what we do is we strongly encourage people who are doing a fishing derby to do it in a location that is appropriate to the size of their event. If you can right. imagine uh, lining a, a 30 acre location with with 20 kids, it's not going to be very hard for them to uh, get away from the noise of those kids or adults or, or whatever we're looking at. Mm -hmm. And 20 was a bad example for me because we do ask that there are at least 50 participants before you're qualified well, we're, to be a fishing we're hitting, we're hitting about 80 and then yeah. we'll probably do, we're, we're getting real close to 120, 140 this year. So yeah. absolutely, we're, we're, that's great. Yeah, yeah, we're expanding our area and trying to but we are trying to get those fish localized. We're, we're trying to get people to catch more fish. Mm -hmm. um, so to add to that, my other question was, would, would it be smarter to leave the block off net off and just give them more bank area to fish? Or is that just going to give those fish too many places to spread out and get away? Um, yeah. So I'll tell you, I'll tell you a short story so we can uh, get back on this, but so years ago, we used to do an event called uh, the Outdoor Expo, and they, they spent a lot of time putting in block off nets and things like that because we were in a 50 acre water body. Mm -hmm. And I, I was the person that put the fish in the nets. And I know that there are three to 500 fish that were put in these nets. And mm -hmm. even though they were only 10 feet off the bank, <clears throat> the catch rate was terrible. So um, it really becomes those situations where if those fish are in a block off net, they're going to do everything they can to get out in a way. And somebody that did their first 15 years for the agency working for a fish hatchery that same fish every day, uh -huh. catfish are really good at finding their way out of a net. And once one finds that way out, the rest of them follow. So then you've got your, your group that's fishing in a place where all the fish are working to get out instead of mm -hmm. trying to eat. So so it would probably be better for us not to do the net and just let them fish more of the area Yeah, is what yeah, it I, sounds like to me. Right. Um, that, that would be my suggestion. Um, there's very, I'm sure that there are situations where a block off net works just as well. But when when you put a lot of fish in a, in a quarantine space, it just doesn't always translate into um, right. success. Well, I'll get with Bo later and we're going to talk about switching over to that pond. I just, it, this is our second year. I mean, it's growing. So I, I want people to come out and enjoy the fishing and catch more fish, obviously. So, right. Uh, we appreciate but, you. Uh, yes. But this year, uh, we're, we're kind of stuck where we're at and I'm hoping that we don't, uh, turn anybody away without a low, with a low catch rate. But last year, right. you know, they went, the couple of people went outside the net and started catching catfish. Yeah. So we caught one catfish inside that net last year and the rest of them were caught on the outside of it. So that makes me think that we'd be better off just to lose the net and let the fish go. If they don't feel like they're quarantined, uh, maybe they'll hang out in that area a little yep. bit, a little yep. better. So, yeah. All right. Thank well, you, I appreciate it. I didn't mean to back you up on what you were talking about. I appreciate it. No, oh, no it's, it's okay. okay. Um, so a few more on the rules and regs, uh, and then we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about, uh, some questions, uh, 
we do allow one derby per calendar year per sponsor. You know, I was talking about Gary Casey had um, the the big catch happen one time in the spring, one time in the fall. But Mr. Casey, he is the sponsor of the first one, and he has a partner organization that sponsors the second one. So um, we just don't want the the system to be abused. So we do ask that it is one sponsor uh, per event. If y'all want to take people fishing 15 times a year, that's perfectly fine. And I appreciate you and applaud you for it. But we can only provide fish for your name one time a year. Uh, we've talked about the valid fishing license, um, the statewide uh, limits for catfish is 10, three at family and community fishing locations. Um, and I think it's just a great idea to have a, a copy of our fishing regs on hand uh, when you're doing an event, because that's what you want to do is you want to teach people how to fish and how to do it the right way. And you don't want to see people getting in trouble. So go ahead and keep putting questions in the chat. And I'm looking back at that to see what new things we have. Absolutely. Um, we have several, especially when it comes to school groups that do uh, catch and release derbies. If that's what works best for your situation, by all means, that's uh, we want you to do what's going to be best for, for your group. Um, uh, so it, a lot of questions, um, about the private bodies of water. So that it just gets us in a, in a bad situation. We, <laughs> we just have to stick to public bodies of water, um, when it comes to fish stockings. And we understand that there are situations where that is not as easy as it is at others. But as far as a policy, we have to go with public bodies of water with publicly bought fish. Or paid for. They're not bought. You, you see what I'm saying? You know, the, the fish, just like uh, everything else, is public domain. So putting it into a private situation. Um, can, can be a little bit uh, of a uh, bad look for us. Any other questions on basically anything that we've talked about, just go ahead and put it into the chat for Um, not seeing any new questions just yet. I have a question if it's all right. Okay. Go um, ahead, Sterling. Me, me and Tonya are thinking about doing a, um, like an ongoing kids club type thing where we can, uh, get a group of kids that would like to, or parents both and get them out together and just do like an ongoing conservation things on conservation different classes on fish and different things like that is there is there any kind of programs for that or is that just something new that we're um i would say when you have your conversation with bo later that that's something that y'all talk about um not knowing the specifics it sounds a lot like something that would be a fit for fishing in the natural state like I said, mm -hmm. it's not just for uh, traditional educators in a in a school setting. 4-H is right. involved. State parks is involved. Uh, we've got a lot of different groups that that are trying to do just like you're talking about. They okay. just want to uh, help people get outdoors, have fun, do it as a family. Um, but I think that'd be a good place to kick off that conversation and and talk it out with Bo. And if okay. if he thinks it's not a fit for for the fishing in the natural state program, then. I bet he he's got an idea of which direction to go. Right. Yeah. Thank yeah. I, th I think our I think our main thing is just that you know there's a lot of a lot of parents that don't really know how to fish or don't know, and we want to get them started on the basics because you know their kids want to fish. They might want to get out and do some fishing, but the parents really don't know how to do that. Yeah. And we'd like to get them together and and walk them through that and kind of help them 
be able to do it on their own at some point, you know, and be yep. able to take their kids out and know what kind of basics they need to get started. So, yep, absolutely. I think it sounds great. Um, best time of year to put on a fishing derby. So my answer to this, and um, I think that everybody, uh, well, most of our derby sponsors have caught on to this trend because we probably complete two thirds of our fishing derbies um, in April, May, and June is uh, springtime before it gets too hot is typically best. We don't, while there can be success in a July or August derby, um, it just seems like by the by the amount of requests that we have that spring works uh, best for success on derbies. Like I said, I've I've done fantastic fishing and all for, but um, you know, one thing that you got to think about when you're when you're having a derby is you absolutely want people to have the best time, and a lot of the time that means that translates to catching fish, but. I think if if you would envision a, a a novice angler going fishing for uh you know first or second time and it's a nice 75 degree day but they're not catching a lot of fish they'll probably stick with it a lot longer than if it's a 95 degree 8 a.m morning in august and they're they have you know they catch a fish at the same rate as they did when it was 75 but they're not as comfortable themselves. So I think that you've got to think about the, the angler's comfort just as much as you do the fish behavior because fish eat year round. They have to, that's, you know, that's how they survive. But uh, catch rate slow, different times of the year, things like that. But, you know, your participants comfort is something that you should also consider on that. Um, can water bodies be closed after the fish are stocked since it is generally the day before? We definitely have sponsors that are uh, capable of doing this. This is not something that Game of Fish can or uh, has the capacity to regulate, but I do know, um, let's take West Memphis City Parks, for example, they're really good. Uh, they got a bunch of signs. They've got an officer or park employee that can go out there. It, they actually put the signs up before we even get the fish in there, but they, because they own the property, they have control over what activities are done at that park. So they can absolutely close fishing at that location until the event. So, if you have that capability, if you have that ownership, um, then that's definitely something that you can use as a tool to keep um, to keep as many fish in the pond as possible until you have your event. Um, yeah, uh, okay. Can students use their own bait or tackle along with their own rods and reels. So I think the reason that we uh, use the terms that we do on this is y'all are a derby sponsor and we provide support for you. This is your derby. So it's whatever rules, as long as they do not violate our rules that you want. So if you've got students that have their, their own gear, that's one less fishing pole that you've got to come up with for that. So if your uh, school organization allows them to bring in their own stuff, absolutely, that's less pressure on you. Uh, okay, so uh, there's a group that uses Boy Scouts to, to work that. Um, good, good. Um, what other questions do we have? Okay, we'll give us a few minutes to type things into the chat. Um, so the last thing I had on my agenda was just talking about helpful tips for a successful event. That's kind of um, where I was leaning earlier when I was talking about the best time of year to have a fishing derby and thinking about um, 
your participants and the people that are coming out there uh, thinking about your volunteers. I mean, it's the same thing. You want your participants to have fun. You also want your volunteers not to uh, uh, have a bad experience because it's 2000 degrees out there, right? You want them to come back and help you with your next event. That's that's how we keep this thing going. So, you know, making sure that uh, at least for your volunteers, if you want to provide it for your participants, if you've got partner organizations out there that can help, you know, providing light snacks, water, or telling the people that are coming, you know, when you do your advertisement for recruitment for your event, you know, bring your snacks, bring, bring things to keep everybody happy, cool, calm, sunscreen, chairs, you know, uh, I'm not, I don't think there's many groups out there that are going to provide chairs for everybody that comes to their event to sit in. So these are things, if you set those expectations when you're starting your event, when you're advertising, if you do a registration, if you let them know, this is what we've got, this is what y'all need to bring to have the most enjoyable experience. I think that goes a really, really long way. Um, as far as baits go, um, you know, we're going to give you a few bags of prepared baits, but like, you know, uh, you know, with catfishing, it's a little bit different, but there's $10 lures out there when it comes to bass fishing, right? Uh, that's not something that's cost effective for something like this, but hot dogs and cheese and liver and, you know, all those grocery baits, as we like to call them, are fantastic and, and catfish are just as likely to go after those as they are something else you know one of the things that i love and if you've got you know like you've got different groups that they're not going to want to you know people in the group i should say they don't want to touch them because it's slimy it's wiggly whatever but if you're in especially some of these family and community fishing locations it's not just catfish in that pond you know i, I would nearly guarantee that you're going to have a broom species in any location that you're fishing not guarantee, but I nearly guarantee it. So using a worm, which a catfish is just as likely to hit as a brim or a bass, is it's expanding your range. Whereas if you got uh, some smelly, who knows, liver, or, or I hear people are using bacon. Um, but if you are targeting just catfish, then you're limiting the amount of catch rates you're going to have. Because, yes, we're providing y'all with catfish, and that's what most people are going to catch. But there's more species in there. And in the end, most of your participants don't care what fish is on the other end of that line. They just want to catch a fish. So using something like worms, something that multiple species of fish like to go after, is really helpful. You might can catch a brim off of a, uh, a piece of hot dog, but it's going to have to be a lot smaller than that piece of hot dog you're using to catch a catfish. So using different baits, um, sunscreen, shade, chairs, um, there's probably others out there. I know there's others, but just thinking about the comfort of your participants. Um, and like I said, setting those expectations for them, you know, this is what we're going to have at the event. And this is what you should bring. You know, I think that goes a really long way. Okay. Tara was already, already taken care of that. As far as a limit of poles a person can use at one time, typically there is not a limit on that, but the, uh, the catch-all phrase that you'll hear me use most of the time when I'm doing this is always consult your rules and regulations. Check that fishing guidebook and make sure that um, you're not using a water body that has a special regulation. Okay. So if it's your, uh, you know, a school pond or something like that, you're likely in charge of those regulations. But if you were, um, you know, there's some locations, even some of our family and community fishing locations, uh, they may not have a pole limit, but there are certain locations that are 16 and under and 65 plus. So that's not some place where you would want to have a family derby because while we want family derbies to be um, what we're striving for, uh, there's just certain restrictions on a few water bodies out there. So getting, getting a copy of that reg book, 
uh, whether paper, paper or online, I think just helps you um, in the end, make sure that you're following in the, uh, the rules and regulations for the state as along with the water bodies. Yeah, uh, yeah, definitely. You know, if you're using a water body that doesn't have facilities, you're you're going to want to make the investment for porta potties, or you're going to have a lot of people leave real fast. Because if you bring a, a a group, you know, a group of five or six out there to go fishing, odds are somebody's going to have to go to the bathroom faster than somebody else. So the whole group may have to leave if you don't have uh, porta potties or bathrooms on site. Any other questions out there or, you know, I, I'm more than willing for for hot tips to be entered into the chat as well, because this is a group effort, you know, we, you know, we want people to share their successes and and make sure that we're all, you know, working in the same direction for a, for a great experience. So that's a great question. Um, I probably should have covered that. Derby kits are, unless other, um, unless other, uh, oh my God, unless you set it up some other way, Derby kits come with the fish. So you will need to make arrangements to meet that fish truck at your water body. So whenever you're approved, you're sent, uh, your derby will be sent to a hatchery around the state. And that group will coordinate with you on when your fish are coming and when, when and how you will get your derby kit. While we're waiting on any other comments or questions, uh, I wanna thank all of y'all again, uh, this group, is is what makes fishing so much fun and it makes it accessible to so many more people than if our staff of five was trying to do derbies around the state in person um it would be near impossible we would not have the the volume um <clears throat> that we do there's there's no way we could pull off 300 derbies if if it was just us so this group uh, and others just like you are extremely valuable and vital to the success of fishing in Arkansas. And we definitely appreciate it. Tara, Bo, have I left anything out? Just, you know, anytime you have any questions, just shoot me an email, give me a call, and uh, we'll work through any problems you may be having. Same here for anybody that's in fans, my fan sponsors out there. Uh, anytime you have any questions or concerns, feel free to reach out and talk with me. Uh, also, it, remember, if you're a fans sponsor, you will not receive this derby kit that's been talked about because you already have that educational material in the fans kit. Let's see, uh, not seeing too many more questions. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I cannot, just like I'm singing y'all's praises right now about essentially being partners with Game and Fish and getting fishing out there for so many more people throughout the state. Uh, y'all are our partners in this. And Y'all reaching out to partner organizations in your community, um, you know, whether it be for prizes, food, water, whatever that is, there, there's so many people that are willing to, to give back to their community and utilizing those will just make your event so much more successful. And when y'all are out there looking for these prizes and stuff for these kids, keep in mind as adults, we tend not to think about these kids. I've had derbies in the past to where I've sat there and watched kids try to trade off complete camping sets for a free personal fan pizza. We don't think like they do. Nothing's too small. Nothing's too big. Yeah, I mean, yeah, that's a really good point, Bo. Um, 
you know, one of my lasting memories, and I always talk about it, is being at the Hatchery Derby, and we put, you know, Joe Hogan Safefish Hatchery. It, it is not uncommon for there to be five to seven thousand catfish in our pond for our derby. Seems like a huge number. It is a big number. I've seen people catch 10, 15, 20 pound catfish. But the biggest smile I ever saw on the banks of that pond was a little girl that probably had 30 green sunfish on a stringer. And she was the happiest person out there. And green sunfish is not even something that people want to eat. They were about that big, but she had been catching fish all day. And it made her day, and I have no doubt it made a lasting impression. And fishing is something that she does, and it's something that she will always cherish. So it's not about the size of a prize. It's not about the size of a fish. It's about that special feeling that you get out of that. So just try to keep that in mind that it doesn't have to, you don't have to give away five kayaks for your event to be a success. You know, people just enjoy the experience and that's what it's all about so uh once again i i truly appreciate all of y'all and if you have any questions reach out to me bo or tara we'd be more than happy to to help you in any way that we can to help make y'all's events more successful i don't think we have any more uh questions well, let's, here let's there was a, something yeah. about rain um i there's not much we can do as far as rain because you're not going to have that 30 days out that turns into a um if your event scheduled for a saturday those fish are coming on thursday or friday and if you want to move your event that's fine but the fish are going to be there you can cancel but as far as moving uh, that's a different um that yep yeah, that's in the, the list there that's just something that scheduling is just not not going to allow for well guys i've got to get out for here i appreciate uh everything y'all do uh bo is a huge huge great uh person that, uh, he's a lot of help to us and did a lot for us to, to get our uh our derby on the road i will be keeping in touch with him and i appreciate everything that y'all do thank you Thank y'all all. And like I was saying, you know, if, if you do have a rain issue, we can get the fish there. You know, you may just have to adjust when, when you're going to schedule it on the ground. So we appreciate it. And we will do all that we can to help y'all. So thank you very much. Good luck with your derbies. Bye guys. <laughs>